Come here. Sit. Well, you're too far. You're out of the camera view. Come here, buddy. This is Stanley. Sit. Sit. This is Stanley's roadmap to success. Um, so basically, Stanley being a hunting dog, he uh, has a great focus, but right now he's focused on everything but uh, his guardians when he's distra uh, out and about. In the house, he has great focus for them. So um, basically, um, I'm going to kind of go a little bit of a different order than I normally do. I went over a focus exercise just now uh, with you guys outside. Now, I'm going to go through kind of the steps for this. If you forget how to do it, message me, and I'm happy to, uh, hey, buddy, sit. That's passive training. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so I want you to, uh, if you have any questions on this, message me. I have videos on my website. You can search for focus exercise or just text me and I'm happy to send it to you. So the first stage is you're going to have about 12 treats per uh, practice session. You're going to have one treat in your uh, dominant hand, the rest of them in your other hand. Have your knees uh, shoulder width apart. Sit down and you want the dog's head about right here in between your knees. You put one knee, a uh, one here and hold it, press it against your knee. You'll have that wet spot like he did. And then basically just wait for him to look at you in the face. When he does, one second, one second, go straight to his mouth and say the word focus. Now, um, you wanna do this for all 12 treats, then you wanna to move to a different part of your house the next time you practice this. But this time you're gonna go one second, two seconds from your nose to his mouth is the only time you're gonna increase the duration. And so now for all 12 treats, it's two second delay. Then the next time, three second delay. As long as he is looking at you the whole time. If he's like, if you're at five seconds, he's like one, two, three, four, five, then go back and practice the previous step. The idea is we want to have for all 12 treats, he's focusing on you for whatever that duration is without moving away. One, and within seven days, you want to get to this where you're in the house and he can focus you for seven, uh, for 15 seconds. The next stage is come out in your backyard, practice this, sit on your ledge here, uh, on your furniture and your, uh, you know, uh, wherever it is. So we want to practice, but because it's more difficult, there's more distractions. We want to uh, make it easier. So one second up, one second uh, to the dog's mouth, but we can move faster. Maybe instead of all 12 treats this time, maybe we do one second up, one second there for four treats and one second, two seconds for four treats and one second, three seconds for four treats. And we get to the point where he can focus on you for 15 seconds outside without the chickens, without the dogs going crazy, just the eat, you know, just being outside. Um, the third stage would be to practice uh, um, on walks. Now on walks, you're actually going to trigger it verbally. So you're gonna be on a walk and there's nobody around you, just tell him to focus, he looks up at you, go boom, boom, and give it to him. So have your hand down at your side, he looks up at you, raise your nose and then back to his, his mouth and say focus. But then you're gonna do this while you're walking, don't stop. Um, and, uh, and again, we're going back to one second, one second, because it's harder. Now you're gonna to get to the point where within a couple of days, you can say focus and he looks up at you for 15 seconds, not looking where he's going because the treat is going down for 15 seconds towards his mouth. So now we've tapped into the focus and made the focus something that actually means check in with the human. Um, and it's great practice for him. Now, um, we also talked about, uh, let me see, the, uh, the video above talks about the steps in here. So I, I'm not going to talk about those, but this, the clicker training, the stuff that we went over in that video is going to be huge. Having him practice paying attention to you in gradually more and more intense situations is really going to be the name of the game. Now, the last stage that I guess I didn't go in the video above that I'll talk about here is when the chickens are out. I would like you to put him uh, on a leash um, or, well, actually, you don't necessarily do the leash. If you've done it right, probably won't need the leash. So just be out here. And then when uh, the chickens are out, have him, you know, as soon as he's rushing over to them, ask him to come back to you uh, and uh, check in and do, do a sit or lay down, a couple of those things. And eventually try to get him to walk over to where the chickens are, where the chickens are in the corner. And instead of him charging, he comes over to you and he's sitting. So maybe you start over here, sit, then take three steps, lay down, three steps. And you gradually work your way over to where the chickens are and you're helping him practice doing different obedience lessons uh, and following commands for you while he's next to the chickens, while he's next to eventually the dog over there. So what we're doing is just setting up for success and we can practice this in gradually more and more difficulty levels, uh, levels of difficulty until he can eventually do it with all the stimulus going on. And we've set him up for success. We've taught him how to behave. We've helped him practice it. And we've helped him practice calming himself down. So that's one of the things when you have the dogs in here playing, having them let them play and then having them practice uh, stopping is going to be really, really important. A lot of us, we just let our dog go and get all wound up and then we wonder why it takes them a long time to listen to us. Well, because they're all worked up. Um, so if we get, if instead of waiting for him to get to level 10 energy, when he gets to level three or four, we call him back down. Uh, when the dogs are playing together, letting them play and then giving them timeouts, asking all the dogs to stop, sit, demonstrate some obedience, demonstrate some control, then let them go back to playing. 
So now you can use the playtime as a way to shape and help your dog practice interrupting things and listening to you and obeying you. And then the reward, and that's the pre-max sort of thing, is if I come and listen to you and sit down with you, then I get to go back and play with the other dog. So doing something less desirable earns me something more desirable. Um, for the little fence part over there, remember, go to uh, Pure One or just look online for some bamboo sh uh, shades. And then basically you put it sideways. So the bamboo would probably go up and down. And you could probably go from the, uh, the, the power post to the first post of the fence and just cover that up. Just take a bunch of zip ties and put it in there. And I'd probably put one on either side of the fence. Ask your neighbor over there if it's okay. And so that way he won't really be able to see and the other dog won't be able to see. The other dogs won't charge the corner. He won't charge that corner. And so it'll kind of reduce the intensity of that, uh, the fence fighting. Um, okay, um, now we, the first thing we talked about uh, uh, was uh, really asking about how much exercise he gets. Being a pointer, they have a ton of energy. And the guardians do a good job of walking him, but I think, like to see the walk supplemented by some other for creative forms of energy, uh, of exercise. So I talk about the doggy Stairmaster, the guardians here play fetch up and down the stairs, it's the same thing. Uh, remember to do all these things with an empty stomach. Walks are okay, but any sort of lateral movement, we don't have any food in the stomach about 90 minutes after before we exercise him. Um, also remember to exercise him before you take him for a walk, before you have people come over, before you try to introduce him to another dog, before you go for a walk with this neighbor dog, which I would highly advise you set up. That sets him up for success. Just make sure he has 10 minutes to recover after the exercise before you take him out on the walk or to the dog park or whatever it is. Um, okay, so um, uh, doggy stairmaster, count and figure out you know how many times you need to go up and down for various things. For a walk, I need to give him 25 up downs on the stairs, and then on the walk he's pretty good. Or before we uh, go walk with the neighbor dog, we have to do 35 up downs on the stairs or whatever it is. So you want to kind of calibrate, and figure out what he needs to set him up for success, so you can achieve that and put him in position to succeed instead of stacking the deck against him, which is what a lot of people inadvertently do. So um, uh, let me see. So other forms of exercise, I'd like you to get a snuffle mat and feed him his meals out of those. I think that he probably needs about three cups of food a day. So if you just add an extra cup during lunch, um, he eats out of that snuffle mat uh, three times a day. That's like uh, almost a walk that you get just from feeding him out of the snuffle mat. Playing some scent games is a nice way to burn some energy. Playing fetches out here is great. The go dog go a machine uh, or just playing fetch manually will work. Uh, but uh, the, remember for dogs, uh, his energy si or his breed, he probably needs m probably at least an hour minimum of every day, probably needs more than that. And it's best done in small increments sprinkled out throughout the day. So if you get up in the morning, maybe do a little bit of the doggy Stairmaster, then feed him, uh, you know, a couple hours later he does fetch, a couple hours later he does ascent games, then we feed him again with a snuffle mat, so, and maybe we uh, do the fetch again, then we take him out for a walk after work. Now we've kind of set him up for success and we've burned his energy more appropriately uh, spread out throughout the day. All right, we also talked about the importance of rules. Uh, most of my clients don't have any rules for their dogs, and for dogs, they perceive leadership um, in, in a certain way by who is enforcing the rules. Dogs kind of share leadership, they don't have one leader, but they do take turns leading, uh, being a leader in different departments. And right now, the guardians didn't really have many rules. They had a wish for him, and uh, that was about it. And so if a dog doesn't have a lot of rules, it sees you as a peer, and if it sees you as a peer, then listening to you is now optional. So I went over some rules. Uh, the more we enforce these rules, the more the dog sees us acting like a leader. Um, first rule I usually suggest is not allowing the dogs on the furniture because the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have. I didn't ask the guardians this, but um, a lot of people have their dogs sleeping with them. If you want to have them sleep with you, that's fine. Um, I would just make sure that he has to get an invitation to get up on the bed, and I would have him lay on the bed where you want him to lie. My clients from yesterday, the dog likes to lie between them, and he kind of interrupts certain things that they would like to do. So if uh, you're going to share your bed with your dog, tell your dog you're on this side or this side, maybe alternate or at the foot or wherever it is. It's my bed. I get to say where I want to share it with you, and if you don't like it, there's a whole lot of floor for you. Uh, remember those X mats will help uh, police uh, getting off the uh, keep them off the furniture, and then uh, uh, teaching them to use the dog bed on command. So remember, t show him you have a treat, throw it on the dog bed. He goes over and licks it up, say Jamaica or whatever the word is. Wait for him to vacate it, throw it again. Do that for about 15 treats. The second way to do it is when he's not paying attention, throw a dog uh, treat on the bed so it's there, but don't point out to him. Let him find it on his own. When he does, say the word Jamaica. Third way is you put him in a sit or an lay and put the treat in his mouth, say uh, Jamaica or whatever the command word is for the dog. Bed. Dog bed. Remember, try to come up with funny command words for all the future commands uh, that you teach him. Try to come up with a funny word, a slang word um, that's going to make you and your friends laugh. That really is really beneficial. It's cutting edge dog training now, but in a couple of years, that's what everybody will be doing. Um, and so, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, 
Remember, rewarding by breaking a rule is very confusing and frustrating for dogs. If you want to reward him, give him a belly rub, play tug of war, take him for a walk, play frisbee, whatever you want to do. Don't uh, reward him by breaking the rules because that'll just give him a taste to want to do that again. So rules should be in place for a minimum of 90 days and after that, if you want to let him on the couch just because you want to, don't, don't do it as a reward for him doing something. Otherwise, he's just going to keep on pining to get there. Um, going back to the dog bed, um, um, after a while, he'll just start going hanging out at the dog bed. When he does on his own, then I throw the treat. So now at first, I, uh, we use the treats to entice him to go there, and after a while, we give him the treats for compliance. And so now we're paying him for doing the job. Um, other rules we talked about, you have to sit at the door. Remember, sit. If you don't sit within three seconds the first time you say it, I walk away, sit down, wait one minute, and then come back and give him another opportunity to do it. Sit. One, two, three. You don't sit by three, then I sit down nearby, and I wait for, one, uh, for two minutes this time. Next time I walk away for four minutes sitting down, and then I sit down for eight minutes and so on. Until eventually when I go to the door, I tell him to sit. He sits right away. As soon as he sits, the door opens. So remember, this is the pre-max sort of thing. So you know, I'm asking him to do something less desirable, and that gets him something more desirable after the fact. So, um, all right, let me see. What else? Uh, other rules. Shouldn't be allowed within seven feet of a human who's eating. It shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. And remember to use the exercise I showed you out here on the deck. If you forget how to do that, you can go to my website and just search for invisible or the word kitchen. And I have a video that it demonstrates the exercise that I showed you on keeping him behind a boundary. Remember to practice that though. Uh, you don't have to throw the treats on the ground. You can do that, but just microwave the bacon or whatever it is. Create a scenario where he wants to do the thing and you can help him practice the behavior. That helps him practice self-control, respect for using authority figure, impulse control, um, respecting boundaries. You're accomplishing four or five important things uh, through an exercise that's very, very easy to do. He's a smart dog. He got it really quickly. And then he can gradually start adding more and more stuff or drop more treats or other things and making it more and more challenging for him. Just like if we work out, we don't work out the same level. Eventually, we add more weight, more duration, or more distance, or whatever it is. Same sort of thing for him. We need to gradually increase his, uh, uh, the activity uh, and the level of difficulty to help him work up to what we want him to be. Um, we also talked about uh, uh, petting with a purpose and passive training. Remember, petting with a purpose is if he nudges you, whines, whimpers, barks, paws at you for attention, he's telling you what to do. Leaders tell, followers ask. So instead of acquiescing to him, give him a counter order. Tell him to sit. If he's already sitting here, ask him to sit over here, or ask him to lay down. Better yet, tell him to lay down. If he sits or lays down, pet him under his chin, say sit or lay down, or whatever your word for it is. Crash is the word I use. And then uh, pet him as much or as little as you want. Avoid saying good sit or what a good dog or all the rest of that stuff. Remember, they hear the first word that you say. So um, if he doesn't sit within three seconds, show him. I've got other things going on. Playing hard to get, remember, works great for dog training. Uh, remember to use the watchword and paycheck if, uh, and, well, eventually he'll start sitting down to prepay for attention. When he does, make sure you reward him for that. Otherwise, he'll go back to nudging or pawing or doing other things. Uh, now, remember to use that watchword. Paycheck means I suspect you might have forgotten to pet with a purpose. Even if I did it right, I'd stop petting, tell him to sit. When Stanley sits, put him on his chin, say sit, and say, actually, I asked him to sit. When you close the door, he stood up. But thanks for reminding me. It's a gentle reminder, not a gotcha. Um, we also went over uh, the importance of rewarding the dog for the things that we do like, which is a very, very underrated thing that most people don't do, but it's super easy and it really helps the dog tremendously. So remember, passive training is just waiting for the dog to do the thing that you want organically and within that three second window of them doing it on their own, rewarding them. So every time he comes to you, pet him and say come. Every time he lays down, pet him and say crash. Every time he sits, pet him and say sit. Come up with a fun word. Every time he takes his first bite of food, you say chimichanga. That becomes his word to eat. Um, every time I drink, my dogs drink water, I say agua. So I can say agua, and my dogs go to the water bowl and drink. So uh, anything that he does unusual, you can teach him to do that. Um, and you can name all your individual dog toys. So now we've created a vocabulary, and we know the dog knows what it can do to make us happy. Most of us confuse our dogs because any good attention and bad attention, remember, is the same thing. So it chews, barks, jumps up, we tell it no, we correct it, but it sits, lays down, comes to us, we ignore those things. So passive training is a great way to celebrate the things your dog does and motivate them to do them more in the future to ask for your attention. And that's why I use uh, celebrate as the watchword. So if somebody says celebrate to me and Stanley's here, I just turn and start petting him right away and then I identify what is he doing. Oh, he's standing there? He probably just came to me. I missed it. My partner told me. And so I started petting Stanley and I said sit to mark the behavior. Um, so uh, make sure that you're using celebrate and, uh, and uh, uh, paycheck. Uh, it'll take you about a month or two to get the habit of petting with purpose and passive training. But once you get in the habit of doing these things, every single time you pet your dog, it reinforces the control dynamic. It helps increase the dog's respect for using a 30 figure. I'm losing a little bit with the wind. Um, it, uh, let me 
see what else does it do. It helps uh, make your pets more valuable because they're earned versus being given to them. Make, it increases his confidence because he's uh, earning those pets. And it helps him practice sitting and laying down and all these other things that we want him to do. Uh, we're demonstrating that these are things we want to get our attention and he'll start doing those things to ask for it. Um, let me see, we also went over the escalating consequences. I don't go over those online, but if you have, uh, in the video, but if you have questions about those, let me know. I'm happy to go over them with you. But again, if you search for uh, kitchen or invisible, it'll show you how to practice that invisible line. And that's pretty much what we went over for that particular exercise. Now, um, I'm gonna, uh, what do you call it? Uh, for the dog parks. Um, a couple things, a lot of us, we think of the dog park as a gym, but it really should be a place that our goes to socialize. So I think exercising him before he goes to the dog park is helpful. I think him practicing playing with the dogs here, in the backyard here, the neighbor dogs, is gonna be super important. If you can befriend this dog, it'd be great to play with him as well. But remember, keep those play sessions very short. Keep the intensity level from getting too high. It should never go above level five energy. Even if they're having a good time, helping them practice settling down is the key to the game. Now you're also helping them keep them from getting too high. If they get too high, that's when the fights often happen. Now, if he goes to the dog park and he runs in and races around the dog park, that's gonna show up the other dogs. That's probably why the, part of the other reason the other dogs come to hump him. Probably some of them, they're just kind of impolite dogs. Uh, but if, he can, uh, if we can exercise him first, go to the dog park and have him be relaxed, that's gonna have a much better result. So what I do is when I go to the dog park, what you might wanna do is practice going to the dog park without going into the dog park. So go to the dog park, get out of your car, do a little clicker training, what I showed you in the video above, and then get back in the car and come back home. So next time you go out of the car, do you know, uh, 10, 15 treats with a clicker training, maybe take one or two steps towards the entrance to the dog park and then go back home. So what we're doing is we're teaching him just because we're at a place where the dog park is doesn't mean we're always going in. And we're also helping him practice some um, listening to us and some obedience near something that's very stimulating and, and enriching for him. Gradually, you'll be able to walk closer and closer to the dog park, but as you're walking there, Ask for those stops every once in a while, and ask for a sit, ask for a lay down. And it might take several practice sessions before you can actually get to the dog park, get to the entrance of the dog park. But you're not going in. And so he's gonna be less and less excited. And if you're exercising him before he does this, he's in a better mood. What we want to do is have him go to the dog park, have a positive experience where he practices focusing and checking in on you and doesn't have a negative experience. So eventually when we get to the point where we're actually ready to go to the dog park, and I don't know, you know, give yourself a month at least of working on this stuff and message me before you get ready to do this and we'll talk about it. But when, if you do feel like going to the dog park, this is how I would enter the dog park. Once the dog is calm enough, it can walk in a very calm manner from my car to the, to the dog park entrance. They have what's called a transition box, a little two doors to keep dogs from escaping. What I do is I tell my dog to sit before we even go in the transition box. If he won't sit, I don't even bother going in. And I might, we might walk away if he doesn't. So uh, let's say I go there and I tell Stanley to sit and he sits. Well, then I would reach for the latch. As soon as I reach up, he's probably gonna get up and be all excited. I pull my arm back and tell him to sit. When he sits, I reach again. If he gets up, I pull my arm back, sit. He, and then he sits, I reach again, he gets all excited, I pull it back. I only do that three times. The fourth time I just pull back and I just wait. If he sits in that, in that three second window, then I would reach again. If he doesn't sit, we leave. So what I'm saying is if you don't do what I want, we're not gonna go in there. You gotta do all the steps that I want and it requires you being in control and calm. So eventually you get to the point where you can actually touch the gate and he stays seated. Then I, I, clam it, I slam it around. I wanna make it as noisy as possible. And, and so he stays seated. Once that's the case, then I open the gate and we go in the transition box. I close the gate behind me. Before I take the leash off, he's got to sit and be calm again. And uh, so I, I tell him to sit. He sits. I start reaching the leash. He wiggles. I pull my arm back and I just look back at my phone. This part will take you. And there might be a, a couple of visits where you go in there, get in the transition box, and you can't achieve this and you end up leaving. That's fine. So eventually you get to the point where you tell him to sit. He sits. You can reach all the way, detach the leash, take it off, and he stays seated. He is nice and calm and he's in control. He's paying attention to you. Now I'm ready to start the process. But what's going to happen is as soon as you open the gate, all the other dogs are going to rush him, and that can be intimidating for a lot of dogs. So what I do is once my dog's nice, I've achieved my dog being calm. While I'm doing this, I'm not a pre I'm not a prejudicial person. I don't prejudge people. I post judge people. So while I'm doing this and tell my dog to sit, well, I'm kind of having some time to do. So what I'm doing, I'm looking in the dog park and I'm observing the dogs that are in the dog park and the dog's handlers. If there's a dog in there that's dominating the other dogs. It's humping them. It's playing too roughly. It's barking. It's just too aggressive. I don't want to expose my dog to that. So I would just look at this as an opportunity to practice of my dog being calm in the transition box and then leaving. Or maybe go outside and do some clicker training. Sometimes that dog will leave and then you can go back in. I'm also looking at the guardians. Are they all sitting in a corner smoking cigarettes, not paying attention to the dogs? Or are they watching their dogs? Are they giving their dogs timeouts? 
you can decide when your dog goes in there if it's going to have a good experience or not just by observing that. So let's say I observe and I like all the conditions in there. The guardians seem to be paying attention to the dogs. The dog energy level doesn't seem to be too high. So if I want to try to go in, I go to the transition box, I lift the gate, uh, I just check the sound of the gate latch. That's going to cause all the dogs to push the gate. I pull back and I stop. I don't want my dog to run out there and get accosted by all the other dogs. I want my dog to go in there and be nice and relaxed. So I wait for the other dogs to lose interest and then I jiggle it again and they come and rush. Usually about three or four times after about the fourth or fifth time, you jiggle it, dogs are very routines. That's what I'm looking for. I've already identified that I want my dog to go in there. I've identified, that I've evaluated the people there. I've achieved a calm and balanced dog myself. I said my dog for success by exercising it. Then when I actually open the gate, my dog is calm and relaxed. I let it, I have it come in and I tell it to sit and I close the gate so it doesn't come in and run laps because again, that's showing up the other dogs. That'll cause a problem. And then uh, eventually one of the dogs will come over and sniff him and meet him and he's having a good experience. Now, don't be afraid and shepherd your dog. Walk around with him. If one of the dogs is playing too intense, get in between him and the other dog. Ask that other dog to move away. Walk towards him. The same technique I showed you on your technique by walking towards him. Um, and if, it, if it's, that dog's guardian's not helping, that dog's not listening, there's nothing wrong with leaving. We'd rather you go in there and spend three minutes having a good, successful experience at the park and then leaving, and then going out and maybe having doing some self-control, go in the car, sit down, let him relax and calm himself down, and then go back in and try another three minutes. The idea is to build success on top of success. The last thing that happens at the dog park is the thing that's going to be the, the memory is going to be the freshest for him. So if he gets in a fight and you leave, that's the thing he's going to remember, and that's what he's going to be looking for the next time at the dog park. But if you go to the dog park and he has a good, positive experience, and he was under control, and you achieve, and you go through the same steps, you're going to have the dog being more and more controlled more and more relaxed and now he's practicing de developing some behavior that you like on walks now speaking of walks one of the guardians likes to run and he does not uh, run very well he likes to pull and so exercising before the run will help what I'd like you to do is go out for that run walk that we talked about so go out there have your running shoes and all your gear be stretched and ready to go but do some clicks as you're coming out the house which you've already been practicing like we talked about in that video so now it kind of looks like the same thing but everyone's when he's kind of in a nice position jog from one driveway to the next if you can just drive a couple of uh, jog a couple of paces and then stop you know and then you can uh, and if he's running next to you that's kind of the command word you want to assign so call it pacer or uh, match or follow me or whatever you want to use a one word command so when he's in that position you're gonna say that command. So he hears, you know, match when I'm walking, when he's walking next to you as a, as a match. Um, or heal or whatever the command word is. Teach him to heal is, I would probably not use that word, I'd use something uh, with me or something like that. So the idea is uh, you're just running a little bit and then you stop and then he walks next to you. Because walking, he's okay. It's the running where he starts lunging and pulling on a leash. And gradually we can start running a little bit longer, a little bit longer, but also ask for those check-ins and make sure you reward him if he gives you the check-in. So uh, we want him to understand that paying attention to us and listening to us is what we're looking for and that will get my attention. And matter, matter of fact, when he gives you a check-in, maybe then run a little bit. And if he starts to get ahead of you, don't let him get to the point where he's at the end of the leash. When he starts moving a little bit ahead of you, then uh, give him a and then kind of slow down a little bit and go back to a walk. So the idea is to get him out of there before uh, that's the case. Now, uh, there are other tricks and stuff that you can do. We can go back over our uh, loose leash walking class. We teach him when he gets to the end of the leash to automatically come back to you and things like that. But I want you really to focus on the stuff we covered in today because I want to create a healthy leader follower dynamic so he listens to you. You guys feel like you have the tools to communicate what you want from him. And uh, we build in some paying attention to us. Hey, Stanley, come. Sit, sit. This is Stanley. Come here, buddy. Stanley, come here, buddy. Up here. Stanley, come here. Come here. Sit. You gotta look at the camera a little bit. You're a handsome fella. This is Stanley. Sit. And this is Stanley's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.